um, really is going way in a nerdier direction than that. Uh, this is really about how I started discovering some refreshingly original typography in a space where the publishers, the designers, the art directors didn't need to be respectable or didn't need to be tasteful. And the more I dug, the more I really thought about how some of that came about um, and really talks about a bit of social history. So uh, this investigation of mine has been but working on for years, it started with me just sort of seeing something that I thought was like beautiful and an unexpected magazine cover um, and led to a project which has led to research and many, many questions. But um, it began when I saw this magazine called Bold and I really am reluctant to show the rest of the cover. You'll notice that of a lot of how things are cropped in here. But... <laughs> I recognized the use of the typeface Stilla um, by Francois Boltana, which I've always loved and I've always struggled to find examples of in use because it's really difficult to work with it. Um, the letters have to be arranged very carefully and it almost never sets automatically all that easily. Um, and I was trying to recreate the title for something and realized I couldn't, that L didn't exist in the digital typeface. Um, in the white in the bottom, we see what the digital version looks like, all the digital versions, because there are a few uh, in circulation. Um, and the answer was in the source material, a Letraset specimen book. Letraset published the typeface, and in the original version included a number of alternate characters for many letters so that you could get better combinations of things. And there was that form of the L that I was looking for. I was like, okay, that's really interesting. Yeah, I guess it would make sense in that era that um, Letraset would be used for the titling graphics. It certainly makes sense for a typeface like Stilla that um, works at its best when you have to lay down one letter at a time using rub down type um, and sort of consciously uh, controlling the combination of the forms. Um, so that filed away and became a note as I started looking at some other things. Then another time I came across an image of this magazine cover from Drummer Magazine, which is, uh, it's an interesting publication in many regards, but it is definitely very adult. Um, and here you have a very adult magazine specializing in, you know, very specialized adult themes with an all typographic cover, really well composed, um, that is also essentially a Letraset specimen poster. Um, all of that type came from Letraset. And it was really surprising once again to see that for uh, you know, a publication like this, that they were taking this fresh a route with what they would do with it. So again, filed it away and started just keeping my eyes open for some other examples and some things. So the first step um, of how this kind of my curiosity got engaged, was thinking about the means of production of these. I had identified some Letraset typefaces that I liked, and I was surprised at seeing how they were used. Um, and so I started, you know, as I kept my eyes open, looking for other examples of surprising type choices and surprising type compositions in, as I said, these magazines that were not really under the same kind of commercial pressures uh, to be tasteful. Uh, and you come across a lot of crazy things. And this is where we get into like, it's like, oh, this is funny, ha ha, check out the dirty magazines with the funny titles. Really, this is a funny title because if you know the typeface, you'll get the joke. This is Letraset Frankfurter. Um, <laughs> but, you know, all things considered, that's set pretty well. It's spaced pretty well. The composition is not the freshest, but it's taking some things into consideration. It's clearing the main focus of the photograph, which you can't see. Um, but thinking again about how a magazine in this era had to be produced using something like Letraset, it's not amateur work as such. To be able to just engage in everyday graphic production at this era using materials like Letraset, you had to be able to space type relatively well. 
Um, you had to be able to work out the visual alignments. You had minimal cues for spacing and alignment with the Letraset Spacematic system, which is what those hash marks underneath the letters represent. But still, you had to know how to lay down that type, um, how to scale it probably using a stat camera, how to put together um, mechanicals to do the paste up and send things for color separation and printing. Um, this is not the height of graphic design, but this is workaday work that required some degree of training and familiarity with the tools and the means of how things are produced. If you wanted to publish a magazine, you had to have someone who had a basic understanding of the methods of production and probably some understanding of design or some opinions about design and typography helping you out. Um, and I think that explains a lot of these choices. You have the combination of a product like Letraset, which is very accessible, very inexpensive too, so it was an easy way to provide variety for magazines that you know, needed to jump out from one another, but very much in their own space. And probably for the people producing it, an opportunity to create something with a little bit more graphic personality because they probably got to take a few more chances. I don't think there were a lot of staff meetings about the cover typography of these magazines. <laughs> I think someone was given a stack of photos and said, slap together a cover, this has to go to the printer. And a lot of really refreshing solutions came out of this. Um, this is, of course, uh, Calypso, which we got a brief glimpse of earlier, the Roger Exquan typeface, which I love, and I love seeing it in unexpected places. Much like Stilla, it doesn't show up a lot because it's so specific, but suddenly here's a genre where you can get away with um, you know, some, some choices because it's kind of a one-off, it can be a surprise, it's not doing the bulk of the work for selling the magazine, it's just helping differentiate things a little bit. Um, and there's just example, example after example after this, particularly in the 70s and uh, um, the early 80s, definitely before we got into the age of digital typography, but certainly in the era when we've moved past everything being done with photo typesetting. The accessibility of Letraset is definitely part of what you see in this material from this era. You know? um, and again, with the surprising choices, this magazine has nothing to do about the the wild, wild west. Um, um, and you can see, like again, lots and lots of letter set when you can identify the typefaces. So Rodeo has been adapted by many people, um, but I think this specific version matches pretty well to the letter set version. Um, the condensed sans serif is letter set compacta, which is um, one of their most successful typefaces. It was up there with Helvetica and Futura, and the stuff you'll see just everywhere when you uh, start gathering old Letraset. I don't know if everyone else hoards old Letraset like I do, but trust me, lots of Compacta, lots of Helvetica, which happen to be the two other typefaces we see on here. The other curiosity I see in going through all these magazines is that almost every cover, no matter what typeface is used, is having some kind of practical strap line, whether it be the issue number or the date or the price, in Helvetica set at about the same size. Um, so again, it's probably the same exact sort of sheets of Letraset being passed around. Um, but Letraset Compacta also shows up a lot doing this sort of like workaday um, informational communication on these um, covers. Um, here we see Rodeo and we get into more of Letraset Compacta. Um, this is from another cover from Drummer Magazine, which I'll be talking a little bit more about further in. And again, Compacta is, was drawn to be tight, um, but you still have to space it pretty well. It certainly is gonna show any alignment issues. So someone who is not pretty handy at laying down rub down typography is gonna screw up a block of text like this. But this is handled pretty well, and there's even like conscious choice about using those hairlines for the slashes rather than what was there at the typeface. There are thoughts about what's going in. I think even using the, that broad microgramma that still has the same squarish geometry of compacta is a sensitive choice. Um, and Drummer is very surprising in terms of uh, its typography, which is why I get into it a little bit more as a case study. Um, we have a sample from a Letraset catalog of Compacta here. Um, and on a lot of covers, there's often a mix of um, 
methods of typesetting mixed together, depending on the kind of information that was being set. Um, the title, Stars, uh, is Letter Set Quicksilver by Dean Morris. Um, but the Optima, that little, that little uh, uh, chunk down there, uh, is, um, looks to have been done by phototype setting. It lacks the sharpness that you see in Letter Set type. Um, it's clear, it's been, has a little bit of that softness you see from photo typesetting where things have been scaled quite a bit or blown up on the stat camera. Lots of like film reduction that wore down the sharp edges. But also, it's well aligned. Um, it's pretty straightforward in blocks. This could have been sent to a commercial typesetter who may not have, you know, realized what they were engaging with. Another, well, I'll talk more about it, but another thing that led me to really consider the use of uh, letter set and other kinds of rub down time for these magazines is it's one less middleman if they don't have to go to a typesetter, one less grumpy old guy who may not want to deal with gay porn. Um, but a little functional block like this, you see a lot of it in the magazines. What's consistent in the blocks that I've been able to identify as being photo typesetting um, is that often the spacing is weird. So they're not going to like the best type shops in New York or Los Angeles or Chicago where a lot of these magazines came out of. But the spacing is consistent. This is coming off of some kind of a system. It's not rubbed down type being put down by hand. Um, and a lot of this possibility of working with Letra Set um, is kind of plays into what the company discovered after the material. Letra Set was invented to be a professional graphics art tool they rapidly discovered that it was made typography very accessible. It democratized typesetting by making it possible for someone to go into an art or design supply store and buy their type for a couple of bucks, get a sheet, and throw something together. So it made it more likely that people without training, people without a design or graphic arts background, could do a bit of publishing and set a little text. And that was very, very powerful. Um, and you see an explosion of graphic ephemera you know, from the late 20th century because of that accessibility. Um, because of that ability for someone without a background, uh, someone who has not had the training um, to be able to get something out. The Black Panther magazines have this incredible energy to them, the urgency to get this message out, the urgency to just put together a flyer for your band's show, um, really reflected what Letter Set could bring in the hands of someone who is not worrying about making it perfect, but wanted to have it be just energetic and get it out. And it became its own kind of graphic language, which we can appreciate in a visual form, but is still sort of very powerful in the cultural spaces where it was just an essential tool where uh, you didn't know if you were going to have someone who could do this professionally, you just had to get it out. Um, and that brings us to sort of the... the other side of this that I began considering more and more as I gathered different kinds of publications. Um, and it ties into the time and place where a lot of this work started. Um, Letra Set uh, rose to the forefront of the marketplace during the 60s. Um, and in the late 60s, where there was a time of incredible social upheaval in the United States, in Britain, which is most of where I've been looking at the material, um, you had the start of a gay press. Um, essentially, the, the, uh, the barriers were, f were falling down that made it possible to get something into the public eye that was about the subject of homosexuality. It was penalized, it was suppressed. This was very like edgy, um, barrier-shattering material. And it was very uh, handy for them to be able to have democratized means of production. Um, one of the earliest, most public um, publications about the subject of uh, homosexuality was the Mattachine Review that came out of uh, the Mattachine Society, which had chapters primarily in New York City and San Francisco and Los Angeles, but elsewhere around the country. But the Mattachine Review um, 
their aim of the magazine, as well as the society itself, was to say, we are respectable fellow citizens. We just choose to love people of the same gender. There's a sort of a, a, a sober tone, a respectable tone, a politically charged tone to the writing of all of this. Um, but you see, for a magazine that is being distributed in 1955, um, they're using the low end of the means of production that were available to them. Because again, subject matter like this in the 50s uh, was very, very controversial. They could be arrested for distributing this material. Um, so they are using um, typewriter-based typesetting, um, very, very innocuous sub subject lines for articles that could have been come from a typesetter who wouldn't understand the whole context. Um, even just that very, very simple one-color printing of this magazine speaks to kind of a lower end of the scale of what they were doing. The more commercial end of the of the of gay magazines at this time were very much in disguise. They were meant to fly under the radar. These were this is the whole era of the physique magazine, um, and I don't know what regular people thought about physique magazines. To the gay community, they knew what was going on. Um, uh, physique magazines kept a very, very straight face, as it were, in talking about the subject matter. Uh, these magazines were about physical culture, exercise, improving your muscle tone, um, watching your weight through healthy diet, um, posing for the edification of artists and photographers who needed models to help them practice their own craft. Um, and this tone of, you know, this sort of like reaching back to the classical ideals of the male form, um, allowed them to say, like, everything's cool, it's all okay, nothing to worry about here, this is just about men being manly and active, and that's great, it's, it's, we have to fight the communists, this is all good stuff. <laughs> um, and, and this is essentially what commercial gay publishing was in the era. Um, and there's a twist to... Uh, what had to be considered if you were publishing material that could be considered obscene. It was illegal to send it through the mail. You could publish it, maybe not get raided by the police. Um, people could see it, but it was a federal crime to ship obscene materials through the post. And in the 60s, there started to be a challenge um, against this. Um, there was a, a reference in this uh, opening column to Mars number 21 from 1966 about a lawsuit involving Ralph Ginsburg. Ralph Ginsburg was the publisher of Eros Magazine, which was designed by Herb Blue Ballin. Issue number four uh, uh, was, um, got caught up in a whole obscenity case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, this is the form of insidious social control that could be exercised in the era. In the case of Eros, the issue was not actually this Shakespeare uh, article, but it had a photo spread featuring an, an interracial um, heterosexual couple. Um, and it is widely considered that that is the reason that the crackdown came on this issue, which shut down Eros um, from publication. But at the same time, Manual Magazine uh, was another physique magazine caught up in another obscenity case that also went all the way to the Supreme Court. So there were a few of these cases that went all the way up to that level that were pushing against this notion of the way that obscenity laws were being used to crack down on fringe social groups. So in the case of Manual, um, which finally had its... Uh, its judgment from the Supreme Court in its favor in 1962, saying that, well, really, it's too vague to say that this material is obscene, so let it happen. You can see the shift in tone of the art direction of the magazine, where it became a little bit less about the classical idea and started becoming a little bit more subject subjective and prurient. And Manual was one of a suite of publications that was published by um, Herbert Lynn Womack in Washington, D.C., um, and I realized, looking at 
things that I've gathered over the years that there was a similar magazine called Physique, another Physique magazine, that uh, switched to design that had a bit of echoes of this later version of Manual. And I checked in the credits page, and I think this is also a Herbert Lynn Womack publication because uh, all contacts went to the same uh, post office box in Washington, D.C. Um, but again, the change across this period in question um, is reflected of it becoming a little bit more salacious once the obscenity case went to the Supreme Court. And um, this is a little bit early to see the explosion of the kind of typefaces that we were seeing in the 70s. Letraset hadn't fully saturated the publishing market yet. Um, but you know the, the change in the tone of it getting a little bit freer is starting to happen. Physique Pictorial was another uh, magazine that's pretty famous in this space. Um, that is almost like, it is like punk rock publishing of its day. You can see the scissor lines, you can see that Bob Miser, who is uh, the photographer behind all this, is throwing this together as rapidly as possible and as cheaply as possible. Bob Miser was arrested a few times. He did have um, copies of the magazine destroyed and seized. He was really trying to avoid the public gaze as much as possible, um, G-A-Z-E. Um, and, uh, this is all a mail order business, and it was mostly the revenue was coming from copies of the photographs and 16 millimeter films that he was selling. This magazine was more of a catalog. But you see that even into the later days, he was using like the least expensive methods possible to get it done. And I love the final two issues where you can actually see um, you know, the, the Mac printer text laid down and copied right alongside the letter set stuff. He was just really throwing things together rapidly. But this is incredibly influential, this magazine. Not so much the typography, but um, Bob Miser is kind of like a legend in the physique publishing world. Um, and you know, this is seeping out, just the, again, the urgency of getting this material out. Um, Dilettante was a magazine that was trying to cover more the social side. Um, it had a lot of photography that would raise an eyebrow in it, but this is covering books and plays and movies and had articles um, about, you know, this was a lifestyle magazine coming from an era where, like, you could write about these now. You could publish this. This is after Stonewall by a number of years. This is long after the obscenity cases. But there's still, you know, this is a lower-end publication. Um, they're still using a whole lot of letter set. Um, using the Pignot for the titles, um, a lot of avant-garde in dilettante. And uh, again, I realized that there was a, a business story going in this when I put these two magazines together and realized that they were produced by the same publisher. He basically took the design from dilettante, reformed a new company with a new magazine, and just adapted the same um, overall look. Um, Mandate itself shifted a little bit over the years as it became a more viable commercial um, uh, property, mostly because it had fewer articles and more photography with more skin. Um, but you look at that text, that is someone laying down some letter set. Um, the typesetting is as rough and ready as the title is suggesting, especially if you look at the way that um, apostrophe is just chucked right in there um, with some regular phototype underneath. Um, now, to get into the case of Drummer, Drummer was a little bit like um, Mandate and Dilettante. This is a community magazine. It was a lifestyle magazine, but it was very, very focused on gay male s and communities, primarily on the West Coast. Drummer grew out of um, a political newspaper, uh, the newsletter of the homophile effort for legal protect uh, protection out of Los Angeles in the early 70s. Um, and you already see this incredible mix of type. There's, you know, again, for a, a legal aid newsletter, they're putting a little bit more effort into making this appealing, more you know, friendlier to the community, um, to try to get the get the word out to people. And uh, when the newspaper uh, folded, Drummer relaunched itself as a magazine, a much more straightforward about what its content was about. It was, I think, essentially the cultural interest of um, John Embry, who was the original publisher. And the interesting thing about Drummer, which is, you know, from its, its earliest days, was showing a lot of uh, openness to variety in layout, um, trying to 
take the graphic language of a more uh, broadly commercial magazine and apply it to this more specific subject matter in a sort of more specific community. Um, going through the credits of these early magazines, uh, there were a number of different editors, there were a number of different art directors. Um, I think that Embry's own sensibility uh, was at the root of Drummer's visual approach, this sort of circus-like mix of typography. Um, and this flexibility to its own visual approach. Um, because you see it get a little bit more settled in the years after he stepped back and other publishers and editors took over. But I mean, I just, I l just love so much the exuberance of the mix of typefaces that they use on so much and the flexibility that they take with the layout and the covers. Um, this is not what we think of with stroke mags. Um, you know, and it's not even what we think of you know, for sort of like an S and M mag. I mean, they're, you can tell from the headlines who they're reaching out to, but this is like fun. It's great, um, and it's it's the that contrast, that dissonance. I think really adds to the personality, and I think that was done consciously to help get the magazine out and get more people to check it out. And again, we get to some very like workaday typesetting on the inside. Um, you see more of that blurry phototype, um, and you can see the difference between like the crispness of the letter set stuff and that drummer masthead against the regular um, galley text around it. Um, so it was a mix of like the fast, inexpensive means of production, but what you could get out of it with a sensitive hand being applied to what's done with those means of production. Um, as Drummer expanded into uh, other publications, a lot of that same sensibility and the same set of um, sort of surprisingly delicate and fun letter set designs being used for the design keeps showing up over and over again. Um, the typography and the layouts on the inside were not always as surprising and imaginative. You know, you get a little Bookman swash here to uh, liven things up, but that's pretty, um, that's pretty dull overall page composition. Um, but as it was a mix of writing and illustration and photography, um, you know, the same kind of variety in the approach to the type and um, layout of different pages does show up in here. It's a pretty punchy publication all around. It's not sort of like, dark and ominous, um, as the subject matter might suggest. Um, and as years went by and the means of production available to designers and publishers shifted, just some sort of uncomfortable evolution. And this is also well past the era of John Embry being the publisher, which I think leads to um, them getting a little bit more formulaic and a little bit less sensitive in how things are handled. Like, yeah, there's some there's some punchy color in the text here now that they've moved on to some digital typefaces, but it's not being handled with the same touch. There's a different spirit to it. And that really degraded more and more as the years went by. You can see like even the approach to the tone of the covers uh, just became a little bit sort of straightforward. This feels more like someone who knew how to use Quark Express was told to throw together a cover so they could get something to the, to the printer. This is not composed to this degree, um, and that's kind of a shame. Um, and you see that in other titles that I've sort of traced through the years. Desktop publishing was kind of the death of the freshness of many of these titles, because you could, it was more accessible, it was more democratized. You didn't have to have the same immense innate sensitivity about typesetting to lay down some text um, in a piece of software. Uh, you could count on the fonts having been spaced. Uh, you could just type a word and have text. While that's very powerful, uh, it also is a bit of a shame in terms of the typography. So this all led to uh, um, an issue of Pink Mints, this little zine that I've been publishing for some years, where I just wanted to look at the typography of all of these magazines that I've been gathering. I wanted to reset it from scratch. Um, so I made sure that I had up-to-date subscriptions to uh, Typekit and Monotype library subscriptions so I could track down all the typefaces that I needed. Um, luckily, most of the Letraset library that is available digitally passed on through ITC and into Monotype so I could get most of the stuff. And the stuff that was digitized by URW has ended up with Typekit, so I pretty much had everything at my disposal. 
But what I wasn't expecting as I went through this is that essentially recreating the original typesetting right down to the letter spacing made it immediately obviously how all of these covers were produced. Um, I redrew that L from Stilla, uh, which didn't take that much time. Luckily, I had the, uh, the letter set specimens to use as a guide. Um, but none of that Helvetica is spaced the way you'll find it in a font. That was laid down by hand. I had to even on occasion of these like push the, uh, push the baseline up and down a couple of points or fractions of a point to match the original alignment. Um, but everything had to be really recurrent letter by letter to match the original spacing. It wasn't consistent enough to be photo typesetting in many cases, which is the clue that it was laid down by hand by letter set, is that every letter combination would be different. When you get to the photo typeset lines, it would at least be consistent even when it was weird. Um, I love Frankfurter as a typeface, so I definitely had to do hot dog. And again, the crazy spacing of that uh, compact to italic is very different letter by letter. And the tightness of the Frankfurter was done by hand. It's not the rhythm that comes out of the, the digital typeface that's available. Um, the, uh, you also start seeing when you look just at the typography on these magazines is that they go beyond the sort of the tasteful recommendation of stick to two typeface families and actually pretty effectively mix a lot of typefaces. In many cases, it'll be something like just the price is in a different typeface. And it's often like exactly the right typeface for putting just the price in a corner. Or there'll be a warning that's in a different typeface. Um, and for this riot of different typefaces, it's often like relatively sort of quiet and cohesive in the use of all the things. I mean, this, this drummer cover, um, it took me like a few minutes of identifying all the pieces to realize that it used six different typefaces. But this is also sort of innate to working with a material like Letraset, where you may have a pile of different sheets in front of you, and you would have to switch to a different typeface if only to set text at a different size. Um, and that's also something that we see go away as these publications moved into the digital space where, it was, where it's much easier to scale the text. Um, that's when you start getting into them aping more of the sort of the modernist approach of having just a couple of typefaces tastefully used throughout the cover. Um, this, is a, this is a British magazine which seems to have had typeset from the very worst photo typesetter I could imagine. That word spacing is... I, I couldn't believe it when I finally worked out the formula and realized that it was photo typesetting. All of that spacing is consistent right down to that incredibly giant word space on everything. It's the same width in all those instances. When we get into the sort of middle period where you have a shift from the letter set and the photo typesetting to digital fonts, you see a lot of handling that I couldn't necessarily identify. I don't know for sure if this cover was done with Letraset. I suspect the title was Letraset. Um, the exact version of Avant Garde used for that stacked line appears to be the digital version, but that was definitely all re-spaced by hand. It wasn't just tracked together. Whether it was done with rub down type or with uh, the early digital version, someone spent a lot of time and had a very focused, clear idea of what they wanted um, that column of titles to look like. This. This one cover took longer than any other to do just because of all of that avant-garde and getting those letter combinations to match. Um, once you get into the digital area, it becomes, like I said, a lot more straightforward. Fewer typefaces, not as inventive in terms of the mix of scales or typeface style. Even the compositions are a lot more straightforward. What you see more now is sort of more overlapping of stuff, which is a lot easier to do with software than it was for multi-layered mechanicals and the analog reproduction methods. So that was all very quick. I know it's getting late and we want to get drinks. I just wanted to close with this notion that it was really important to me, and as I dug into this, I did it because there is social history to the means of production and the subject matter of things. Like this, is a, this whole subject is a specific case study. Um, 
because I wanted to really dig into, like, why were these magazines done the way they did? Why were they weird? Why were they different from other kinds of magazines that were done? And it led to some surprising revelations about these things. And I did want to close with the only magazine uh, that I've been able to ever come across that has an erotic scenario happening in a print shop. Because no matter what your orientation, that's at least something near and dear to all of us, is how much, how much we love seeing good printing in action. So thank you very much.